Hello, my name is Tim Black. Welcome to the Tim Black Show. I'm very happy today to have a special guest. He is Bishop William J. Barber II, the president of the Repairers of the Breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. His new book, We Are Called to Be a Movement, will be published June 9th. On June 20th, the campaign will, be ho will hold a historic gathering called the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington with over 100 organizations. It's focused on the lack of police accountability, voter suppression, poverty, and the voices of, of the poor. It's a digital assembly in March because of the pandemic. Bishop Barber, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well, my friend. Thank you so much for having us on. And let me say on behalf of my co-chair, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who's the co-chair here, and on behalf of the 45, it's important that the organizations are okay, but it's the 45 state coordinating committees made up of poor and impacted people that are really hosting the Poor People's Campaign, uh, poor, a mass Poor People's Assembly Mall March on Washington. What a comprehensive gathering you plan to have, and what a great, uh, impressive field of people that are going to be participating. Could you tell us what's the purpose of the, of the event? What are the, those pillars I've been hearing about? Yeah. Well, even before COVID, and when we started this campaign in 2016, 2017, we did an audit of America called the Souls of Poor Folk Auditing in America. And when our economists and others came back, with grassroots folk, we found out there aren't 39 million poor people in America, there are 140 million poor and low-income people. 61% of all black people are poor and low wealth. 66 million white people are poor and low wealth. We found out there are 4 million people who get up every morning, can buy unleaded gas, can't buy unleaded water. We found out there are 80 million people either insured or underinsured. And by the end of COVID, we'll have 13 more million people added and poverty will be over 50%. Poverty and low wealth in this country is already at 43% of this nation. We found out that our military budget, $850 billion, that's more than Iraq, Iran, North Korea, and China combined. And we found out that, that, that these are interlocking injustices. We have less voting rights today than we had in 1965 because of the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. And racism is, yes, what happened to black people, but also First Nation people and Latino people. And it's not just police brutality, it's mass incarceration, it's voter suppression. So our agenda says, there are five interlocking injustices that you have to address together. You can't silo them. Systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the denial of health care, the war economy and the militarization of our communities, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism and white evangelicalism. Those five interlocking injustices are trying to suffocate and choke the life out of our democracy, just like that policeman's knee choked the life out of George Floyd. And in this moment, when people are in the street, it is important that while we are fighting for what happened to George Floyd, that even if he gets prosecuted and they, they put all of them in jail, that doesn't fully address the systemic problem. Floyd was a low wage worker. Floyd, I don't think had health insurance. Floyd had had COVID. Floyd was one of these workers we moved from service workers to essential workers, but we didn't give them health care. We didn't give them living wages. So all of that intersects in his life and the lives of so many. That's why we're having a poor people's campaign. You know, we know as I listen to you, listen to you break it down, Bishop, and think about all of the people that call themselves on the progressive left, which is what I, mm -hmm. I think, you know, ideology wise, that's where I fall. It sounds like, man, you are definitely pre preaching the gospel of what we, what we talk about all the time. It's, it's why we get up in the morning. It's why we do what we do. It's why I do what I do. And mm -hmm. I'm so attracted to your message. When, when you talk about these pillars, they're so obvious that, that, you know, we're looking at surface stuff and we don't go beneath it. We're not going to change anything. What is it in your opinion? Because you've been doing this for quite some time, I'm sure. What is the barrier to us actually breaking through and getting more people involved in this? Well, I think there are two that the Poor People's Campaign have identified initially. And that's one is that you have to change the, nar the nar narrative. And so, for instance, we had 30-some presidential debates since 2016. We got 140 million people poor and low income in this country. Not one debate was held on poverty, Democrat or Republican. We have less voting rights than we've had since 1965. We've had the Voting Rights Act gutted for over 2,000 days. We called Strom Thurmond a racist for, for blocking the 1957 Civil Rights Act for one day. McConnell has blocked the Voting Rights Act from being fixed for over 2,000 days. Then he's got to be a racist at least in policy. The problem is the narrative. Since 68, 
the issue of poverty has been pushed out of the political talk. Even progressives, even Democrats talk about the middle class, Republicans talk about the corporations. It's a neoliberal imagination that is a trap that keeps us from addressing the real issues. And so what happens is we have all these conversations, but we never talk about the bottom, even though it's 43% of the nation. And we tend to talk about stuff in silos. So racism is just police brutality. But there's racism in the denial of health care. There's racism in the denial of living wages. There's racism in the denial of union rights. And instead, what we should be having is an, a moral fusion conversation. And we should have the people impacted giving the narration, right? So we're organizing white folk, white coal miners from Kentucky that are connecting up with black folk from Alabama. The white coal miner can talk about racism and the black folk from person Alabama can talk about the in ecological devastation that's hurting his brother because they are understanding that the same people against uh, who push racist voter suppression are the same people that attack the gay community, the same people that undermine in public education, the same people that block health care, the same people that block living wages. And if they're cynical enough to be together, we better be smart enough to come together. That's the point. The second thing is we got to build power. Not only must you change the narrative, you have to build power. The, the change in the political calculus in this country is among poor and low wealth people. Mm -hmm. The number of poor and low wealth people that are eligible to vote far outweighs the margin of victory of any candidate, president, senate. But oftentimes, neither party, Democrats, I mean, Republicans racialize poverty, uh, Democrats run from poverty, nobody deals with the reality of poverty. 100 million people stayed home in, in 2016, and much of that 100 million people were poor and low-wealth people. Do you know poor and low-wealth people under $40,000 voted against Trump? Why aren't we organizing them? We have a study come out, last thing, that says if you organize 10 to 15 percent of poor and low wealth people around an agenda, you could fundamentally shift the political calculus all over the country and in the South. But that means your leadership has to want that because that means it's going to change who's elected, too. Yes. And so we need a transformation. Yeah. 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 I, I was just thinking uh, the reason why I, I think it's kind of obvious people don't they don't actually want to divert attention to uh, to issues that we care about. Because those issues may not, you know, go well with their their donors, their special oh, interest groups that they prop up, or what have you. I mean, you got you said it. You got the recipe for right. electing whoever you know for for winning the election. But they'd rather lose than go with some go with your program, Bishop, because yeah. they know it's not going to be what they're looking for. And when he talks about neoliberalism, I always try to educate folks, man. When I when I hear neoliberalism, all I think is they're trying to use corporations to right. solve public problems. Is that what you mean? Right. right, and not the government, and not only corporations. The form of neoliberalism that I'm talking about is believing that if you put the money here, mm -hmm. whether you put it here and trickle down like Republicans all the way up or whether like Democrats, you just talk about the middle class, that it's gonna trickle down. And then when you have consultants telling people, don't talk about the poor, right? For 52 years, we've, we've seen that. You know, Robert Kennedy was killed, King was killed. Poverty went off the, 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 the um, landscape. Now we, we hit at it, but you, you can, Democrats will stutter trying to say poor. They'll say, uh, 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 people working. trying to make it into the American way or, 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 or working people, no. Poor are poor and low wealth, and they don't mind you calling that. What they believe is wrong is not addressing it. And guess what? If you raise living wages to, to $15 an hour, that's $638 billion plus dollars into the economy. If you give everybody health care, it not only is a healthy economy, a more wealthy economy, you're going to build jobs, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna grow, uh, grow the country. Joseph Stiglitz, who is, a, who is a Nobel Peace Prize economist, wrote a book called The Cost of Inequality. Not the cost of fixing it, but the cost of leaving it the same. And one of the things he has shared with us is that, that we have this lie of scarcity. We don't have scarcity of money, we have scarcity of will. And now we really know we don't have scarcity of money because when COVID hit, the corporation said, you better fund us or we, or we and what do we do? Two, through almost $3 trillion to corporations in less than 30 days, Two weeks earlier before COVID, people were saying we didn't have the money for health care for everybody. We didn't have the money for living wage. All of a sudden, bam, three bills, three bills passed in the middle of a pandemic. 
Not one of those bills changes health care in the middle of a health care crisis. Not one of those bills says we're going to at least give essential workers sick leave, unemployment, uh, living wages. Not one of those bills says we're going to guarantee people's water can't be cut off. Not one of those bills says uh, we're going to make sure that people have rent forgiveness. Not a moratorium for three months and then in the third, fourth month you have to pay the third and the fourth month together. What do you think would happen to people if we put forth real moral uh, legislation and people knew that, that we were fighting for their lives, they would vote. The problem is, we don't, now people will say it's Trump and McConnell. I say, yes, it is. They are the bad, bad actors. But Democrats also have been guilty of not putting up what ought to be and trying to figure out the compromise before you do the fight. And poor and low wealth people are saying you must do the fight. And that's why we got to show this country what poverty really looks like, because a lot of Democrats think it's, they still think it's just black. We need to show them it's black, it's white, it's brown, it's people all over, and people are coming together. And that's why we're going to be a power. That's why we have 45 coordinating committees registering people. We got 30,000 people in every state that's going to be doing massive registration for people who are part of a movement who vote. Why? Because it's going to take that long term to change our politics, brother. And we, what we, the diversity we see in the street over Florida has, has to become a diversity in public policy, a diversity in our fight, a diversity in our vote, and a diversity in our demand. And that's why I didn't know when we planned this two years ago that this was gonna be happening. God did. We, we didn't plan the Poor People's Campaign, uh, uh, Mass Poor People's Assembly, Mar March on Washington this week or last week or last month. We've been working on this for a year and a half. And so right in the middle of all of this, bam. So on June 20th, we need people to tune in for two and a half hours to hear people that you don't normally see together, counterintuitive people, coming together, laying out their stories, showing America the deep pain, showing America how many people can't really breathe, how many people are dying, but then showing an America the, an agenda and then making a lifelong commitment to build power and change the narrative. David Oelio, who played Martin Luther King and Selma, has said, look, I don't want to speak, but I'm going to join because I'm going to push people to come. Uh, uh, um, uh, Erica Alexander, who played on the Cosby Show, uh, is now in. Uh, um, Vice President Gore, who's been fighting on these issues of climate, he says, look, I'm in. Jane Fonda is in, and I could name more and more. Wanda Sykes, she said, I do more than just a comedian, I'm an activist. She said, I'm in, and I'm gonna be there, and I'm calling people to come in, and we need you to help us push it out, push the PSAs out, because we cannot let all of this energy in the street be taken by the political structure and only used to pass one bill on criminal justice reform. We need that, but if we're seriously talking about dealing with the suffocation going on in America, if we're really serious about dealing with the death in America, if we're really serious about dealing with the violence in America, we need a fundamental transformation of racism, poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, and the war economy. Well, I'd like to just say, uh, uh, Bishop, that, and I know I'm going a little far, you correct me if I'm wrong, but at this point, this, this tragedy that we just saw take place, it sounds to me like if we don't take this time to make this mean more than just locking up these cops, and we don't yeah. take it and use it to the right. best of our ability to do what you're saying we should do with this movement, I think that would be a sin. And I, I know that's going far, well, but that's, it, that's how I feel based it, on what you're telling me. Well, I can tell you it's a sin because in Ezekiel 22, you know, I'm like, yeah, I know the book. When, when God outlined what was the problem in ancient Israel, he said, your politicians have become like wolves. And your in Ezekiel 22, and your preachers are endorsing them and telling them things I never said. And because of that, mistreatment of the immigrant is right. Poverty is, is epidemic. And he lists several things. Jesus said when he came, the spirit of the Lord is promised me to preach good news to the poor, recovery sight to the blind, healing of the brokenhearted, release to the captive, and the declared acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus never had a one-point public policy. The prophets never had a one-point public policy. God said, I'm going to judge a nation, not just by how you do with criminal justice reform, but I'm going to judge you on how you treat the home, the hungry, the sick, the immigrant. And then he added this big category, the least of these. And if the corporations can get three trillion things, then poor and low income, black, white, and brown, people of every race, creed, color, and sexuality ought to get everything we need. You never ask the corporation what one thing they want. 
they get everything they want. And so this is the tip. This is what I want to say to America. What we're seeing now is a public mourning. When, when that man was saying, I'm, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and we watched that lynching from start to finish on that video held by that 17-year-old girl that stood there like David before the Goliath and refused to quit, that captured death in our face. But it captured death in a time of death, a time when we were already seeing 100,000 people die from coronavirus because of negligence, not because of the germ. So we know 60% of those didn't have to die. Then we already had 700 people dying a day from poverty, quarter million a year from poverty already. But when we saw that, it touched something deep because we were looking at the state killing somebody, innocent. And the state is not supposed to kill you. It's supposed to provide life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The state is supposed to establish justice and provide for the common defense and to promote the general welfare and provide you equal protection under the law. But that man in a badge represented us. And when we saw him snuff the life out of that man, many of us started saying, well, I can't breathe either. His, his I can't breathe was him, but it was beyond him. It was the echo of Eric Garner. It was the our children saying it in the future, not knowing what they're gonna have to face. It's all of this pressure and these weights that are on the top and the necks of, of, of us as a people. And now what we see is the democracy is trying to breathe. That's what this in the, in the, in the, is trying to breathe. And we're also seeing mourning and protest. And here's what folk need to know. You don't protest what you think can't be changed. You only protest over what you think can be changed. You only mourn when you love something and you know you, it didn't have to die like this. We, if, if this country lets all this public mourning go and then we come back with the same old, same old, and we don't come back with fundamental change, we may very well end up with a cynical society. And a cynical society is worse than a protest society. That's why I don't even like the way people argue peaceful versus violent. I don't agree with the violent, but, but that's a given. You, you, know, you deal with the violent. But we need to talk about justice marches because they called out the king violent. They said he wasn't peaceful. I got arrested for praying scripture in a, in a, general, in a general assembly in North Carolina and got a charge. I got a case for reading the scripture and saying people ought to have, they said I wasn't being peaceful. Nonviolent direct action has tension in it. It has to, because you're there because folk are dying. You're not just out there in the street for fun. You're out there because people are hurting. And if folk get disappointed this time, we could end up with a cynical society. Now here's just my last point. Protests can bring you transformation. Cynicalness can bring you Hitler. Mm. Bam. You hear what I'm saying? I hear it. In, in, in 1929, when the Great Depression happened, uh, nine years after the swine flu, I mean the Spanish flu, that they named the swine flu to blame it on brown people. That's why they called it the swine flu. They blamed it on Spanish people. So it was racism then. And Woodrow Wilson denied it then. That's why 650,000 people ended up dying in America. Many of them didn't have to die. Same thing 100 years ago, we've seen. But we got a Franklin Delano Roosevelt because of the protest, civil rights movement, because of A. Philip Randolph. Europe got Hitler and Mussolini in the same time of depression. Now, we're going to be in a depression. Right now, everybody's focused on, but the virus is still going. Death is still happening. We're almost at 2 million cases, over 40 million people without work. We might be focusing on the news, but there's a lot of hurt. And you're not going to recover out of that economic just any kind of way. There's going to have to be massive uh, uh, reappropriation of money. Mm -hmm. This society better not let all of this happen. And we just say, well, we're going to fix one thing. And then after you fix that, people wake up the next morning and they're still dying from health care. They're still dying from lack of health care. They're still dying. And then it gets worse next year. God help us if we become cynical. That's why some of us have got to make a commitment to keep alive this form of nonviolent protest with an agenda. And that's why on Monday, this coming Monday, 
uh, we're calling for a national fast. But it's the fast rooted in Isaiah 58. Not where you fast to quit. It's where you say to the nation, here's what you need to quit. God said, this is the fast that I require, that you stop oppressing people. So we're going to take nine minutes and be still. Then we're going to read a litany. America, we're calling you to fast from systemic racism in policy. We call you to fast from denying health care in policy. We're calling you to fast from sort of in policy. Then we're going to make a commitment to dedicate our lives to continue, and we're asking people all over the country, wherever you at at five o'clock in your house, in your at your job on the sour, stop and sit down, lay down, do something, and then join this litany. I'm gonna do a ten minute talk, and we're gonna then move to June 2020 to show the nat change the narrative and build power. And you know what? Tim Black's gonna be there with us, and we TBTV. We thank you, brother. They tell me I got to run. I don't want to go, but they tell me I got to run. But you got our PSAs. We hope you'll play them, and we hope you'll tell your whole audience to tune in. The 20th is not the, the, the end of the matter. It is to give us clarity on how to fight and what we need to fight for and why it needs to be about everybody, and it needs to be addressing all five of these issues and not just one. People, you need to go to the Mass Poor People's Assembly in Moral March on Washington, June 2020. Go to June2020.org. Rever Reverend Barber, thank you so much for joining me, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you, Tim. Keep doing it, man. You got it, man. Take care. A powerful new movement is rising across America. We are the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, and we are building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. On June 20th, we will rise together for the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington, a digital justice gathering. Our nation is at a historic crossroads. But history teaches us that people from all walks of life must build a broad and deep movement from the bottom up. On June 20th, we will come together to lift the voices and faces of poverty in the midst of pandemic for a massive historic online gathering that will embolden us, strengthen us, and prepare us to fight for the kind of society we know we so badly need and deserve. Rise with us. Visit June2020.org. If the news you watch makes you more confused after you watch it, watch the Tim Black Show and know what's going on. Go to patreon.com, Tim's Take Live. Join today.